Hello everyone, today I thought to try something new and to talk about the Assyrian military. Uh, and as you've, you've probably noticed, I, I never ventured before, temporarily before the, the Hellenistic age when discussing history. Uh, I'm not a great expert um, on the previous eras, uh, that's mainly the reason why I, I decided to keep this boundary up to this point today. Um, and I'm definitely no great expert about Assyrian history as well. But uh, I still think it's very fascinating. It can be an option. You know, it will, um, maybe some, something interesting can, can come out of this. And uh, maybe you can help me as well if you're an expert. If I say something stupid, as, as I will probably say, uh, I try to, to be reliable and uh, and to check my sources, um, but um, my videos are a bit generalistic in, in for, um, also towards the audience, so sometimes if uh, an expert comes and says, you know, what, what are you talking about? Uh, maybe with Middle Ages I'm a bit more um, proper, I, uh, as you've seen, I do this kind of manualistic approach to, to that uh, era. Uh, relatively to the other ages, I approach them just um, through military history, because it is really the one that I know best, that I can even think in meta-historical terms and practice, uh, in the sense that uh, military history is, um, I mean, I can't really think in meta-historical terms, but it's really, um, you know, war response to certain logics that are definitely um, proper of all human societies when when fighting and, uh, and and also when not fighting in the sense that war is al always subordinated to politics it's strictly related to society so uh, after all we we haven't really changed <laughs> much in the way we uh, we deal with certain uh, things um, and therefore I, I think I can um, try this uh, thing of talking about uh, the Assyrian military and today uh, we are going to talk more specifically about the um, Sargonian uh, spearmen. Um, we're talking about Sargon II. Uh, we are in the Neo-Assyrian uh, Empire uh, at the end of the 8th century um, BC. And um, really, uh, the um, the idea is, you know, that that, that the Assyrian Empire is something that. <coughs> Had its own uh, its own time, and uh, there are these basically uh, three stages. The the old Assyrian Empire this is something that started basically at the beginning of the mm, second century, uh, second millennium uh, BC, and finished somewhere somewhat around 1750 uh, BC. This is one of those few things that emerge from my <laughs> school memories. Then there is the um, middle uh, Syrian Empire that lasted instead um, from the, the 14th century BC to the um, uh, to the end of the 10th, um, uh, and then the um, uh, Neo Syrian Empire that started uh, arrived afterwards, um, and, um, and 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 so at the beginning, at the end of the very end of the <coughs> Of the twelve uh, of the tenth cen um, century BC and lasted up to the very end of the uh, seventh. So, uh, what do I specifically talk about this? Well, we'll actually talk about the uh, the armies in uh, of the time of Sargon the um, second. So, not just about their spearmen, but uh, we, we're going to focus on on this unit because um, it's. Um, you know, it's something you can draw informations from, from also on the rest of the military and in a contextual fashion. Before that, I forgot to mention that the uh, Assyrian army is, historically speaking, um, not just uh, the most advanced of, uh, of its time, and also the Assyrian Empire, actually the, the most powerful um, uh, empire known uh, uh, in, in its day, uh, this time. Uh, it has an expansion. Uh, Sargon II um, kind of contributed definitely to secure this area that uh, broadly encompassed the uh, large parts of today's Near and Middle East. And um, and uh, but especially the uh, the Assyrian army, uh, 
by um, aside from being um, <coughs> very effective, is also historically speaking probably the first army that is um, relatively uh, relatively well documented at the point of being um, um, of allowing us to to study it with with a substantial degree of um, uh, you know of, of information. Uh, both in its uh, strategy, uh, strategy, tactics, equipment, and, and so on. Um, and historiographically speaking, uh, the Assyrian army has been also subject to debate. How did this guy fight? We have a, f a very few sources and all. Um, today we think that the Assyrian army, uh, especially at this time, was something very, very effective with uh, many characteristics that eventually would have been inherited even by the Achaemenid Persians um, after them, and uh, and um, and also mm, that mm, contributed. Maybe, and this is this the this is roughly the same time to which the Greeks were developing their polis. Um, um, there are, uh, I can't say striking similarities at all because they were very two very different systems. Um, people will see spearmen with shields will say, oh look, uh, yeah, they are there, they also in Greece they did that, well, uh, <laughs> everywhere else they did that, so it's we, we, we should learn how to be a, a bit more, um, to, to observe more specificities about, aside just from equipment, by the way, people are kind of obsessed, I think, when they, they, they look at history at the, as modern people, at the, what kind of weapons they were using, as if that is all that made the world a difference. Tell the truth, we should look at weaponry to, to understand uh, what instead was the really effective thing, that is the, the uh, tactics, that is what these guys did uh, in collective uh, groups, in formations. Um, and this is what I will try to do today. Um, observing um, practically uh, one fact. First of all, let's give a look at this guy. So, um, the Syrians uh, had <coughs> um, essentially the Syrian infantry was the um, um, the the, um, the bulk of <coughs> of the Assyrian armies. Um, it was um, uh, kind of shock infantry was meant to assault, to to take the enemy, and to to essentially achieve uh, the greatest um, results at this point. Uh, up to a certain time before, people believed that there was something like a um, like a, a pre still a preeminence of chariots. Like uh, you know, at this time, uh, really chariots were declining, uh, not just in the Assyrian army. Uh, for reasons that for now we, we don't have to explain and infantries were reaching um, a quite h high degree of tactical development and of interaction and what for many years has been conceived like a mostly um, uh, um, uh, as a supportive arm uh, the Syrian infantry instead uh, was extremely versatile um, capable of performing mm, enough complex maneuvers. There was also cavalry that was rising and specializing in uh, horse archery and in normal uh, mounted uh, spearmen. And yeah, but what... Um, and, and the Assyrian infantry is remembered usually to be an armored one. Um, uh, an armored one, so usually a guy with a uh, helm. Um, the the iconic uh, Syrian armor is this lamellar one that uh, sometimes um, is something you find even in similarly in other contexts, e even if in other fashions in the Bronze Age, sometimes it could be just a torso um, um, protection. Sometimes uh, you could have a sort of uh, even an av of uh, an amentail, amentail uh, under the helm. And uh, and even uh, reaching uh, down to to the knees uh, or or feet, um, and uh, the um, the um, now I'm I'm just searching for for something. Uh, what you see is, is, is this guy is that he is uh, practically unarmored. He has just um, a chest plate. That was also pretty common, and we have to think that uh, this was a kind of a pretty average um, form of, of, of light armor, we can say. If you, if you look even at, I don't know, the Romans of this time, 
even if they didn't exist practically as such, uh, if not in legend, <coughs> you find similar things. But definitely, uh, this form, this kind of armor is definitely a, a light one. Mm. Then you see a small shield, a round shield, and uh, which is, you know, the the the, the Assyrians also um, had um, greater shields um, um, that mm, of square form. Some of them could could reach actually a, a very large uh, dimension, even being uh, tall as much as a man. Uh, some of them were used in this fashion by archers, like a bit um, the uh, the medieval pavis mm, shield um, that was uh, placed in front of the um, of the uh, archer, or in that case, in medieval ages, crossbowman, um, to to allow him, mm, you know, ha a, a protection, granting him a protection while reloading and not being exposed uh, on the field, but also infantry seemingly had. One very interesting aspect of this Assyrian army is that you find um, um, evidence uh, alongside with the, um, with the uh, infantry lines. Usually the, the Assyrians had one or two um, spearmen lines of um, archers that uh, could be deployed in scattered formation, like mm, not all, but uh, some archers did in antiquity. Usually archers are a bit more prized than the normal skirmishers, uh, even than the slingers you tend to, to keep them. Also because learning how to use a bow, I mean, in ancient times wasn't something that difficult, but um, it's something you have to take care of. You know, you need a certain amount of wealth, a certain amount of, mm, of practicing. Um, and um, and the Assyrians developed a kind of, um, as we will be seeing today, a kind of even of a, uh, of an elite um, form of archers, various classes of archers that were also well armored, sometimes even more than infantry. And this is what we're going to discuss today, relatively to Sargonian uh, army, and maybe make some speculation about it. Um, but but in, in in iconography, some, sometimes you find quite clearly um, uh, spearmen and archers paired uh, in couples um, in, in what it seems to be a scattered formations. Now, I, I don't know how to interpret that. Frankly, I have never uh, even watched such sources. In my opinion, it could be also a misrepresentation in the sense that it, it I, I can't think of any other time in history in which such uh, individual couples could exist. Uh, on the battlefield. Uh, one suggestion that has been made is that these archers needed such individual protection because they had a very important role on the battlefield. They, they, claim, uh, they came a quite close um, contact with the enemy and therefore the spearmen were, uh, were there. But what we know more generally is that tactics and formations and units developed separately um, in, in, some, in some measure for which uh, what we know the standard Syrian armies that, that there were one or two lines of spearmen in the front um, uh, arresting the enemy chariots or cavalry of our infantry and then on, like in, in many other times in history archers behind the spearmen who seemingly carried out a um, great part if not even the greatest part of the job the greater part of the job on the battlefield in the sense that archery was meant to hammer and to 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 soften up the enemy at the point of making him break with eventually the you know the um, together with the, the the action of infantry and of cavalry or chariots. Uh, so this idea of, of distinct um, archers and all mm, that uh, had attached a single spearman close to them is something weird. If you look at uh, communal um, Italy in the Middle Ages that we talked about. There is a video make ab made about the Battle of Lignano. It doesn't take into consideration that, but it's something pretty similar. There were um, crossbowmen, we know, that were paired seemingly, although it's very debated with um, with support lancers. Mm. But that still happened in, in a sort of line, so it's possible that um, this um, this mix between archers and spearmen in the Syrian army wasn't, uh, in, in the moments when it happened, was probably much more similar to, to um, 
uh, to a um, uh, a rank, uh, a line of its own, maybe with some arrangement uh, of the between the two the two type of soldiers that we don't really know in its disposition. But this is the point. But the um, the guy here represented is um, um, as a very light. Uh, you see the dagger here, close to the um, to um, born with on the on the belt. Then you see this. Um, he has an helmet with this crest that seemingly uh, was typical of this later uh, of this later stage of the of the 8th century BC uh, that didn't appear before uh, iconographically uh, by the way this is a um, this is a um, uh, um, a figure that is taken from the um, it's obviously a drawing but it's being taken from the fortress of Sargon uh, today's uh, Korsabad, uh, which is in northeast of Mosul in Iraq, um, the 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 fortress of Sargon it, it was called uh, Dur uh, Sharrukin, I I believe if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, it was a very big thing, and uh, th there are lots of I think the re remains of this um, of this stuff have been uh, in part. Um, taken in um, in Europe in the West I don't know where I'm actually concerned that Isis might have caused some damage to what was left there but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure course bad was uh, was at risk um, in, in recent times because of um, of Isis uh, but I think part of these uh, uh, stuff is uh, at the Louvre in, in Paris, indefinitely. Um, well, it's not really important now, just for saying that it's full of magnificent um, pictures about the uh, the ancient Assyrian. Uh, surely every every student of ancient art knows that. I. I just approach these things from from a military uh, interest, even though it's these are artistically impressive indeed. They they have they're beautiful to watch if you if you have the chance just just give a look. And then um, uh, uh, this guy's barefoot, but more of that later because um, there's maybe uh, something we can add. And if you look at the lengths, also is very interesting. And here it's not uh, one of those. Um, uh, it's a kind of short, relatively short lengths. Uh, if if I look at the, it wasn't higher than it wasn't higher than man. Um, and in in this mm, picture in particular, it seems quite short. But one characteristics that usually the the average. Um, uh, Assyrian spears had were uh, a, a balancement at the um, at the back end. It was like a sort of 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 um, of egg uh, of bowl. I don't know something kind of ovoidal um, with a weight, uh, which wasn't at all uncommon at the time. If you look, for instance, at the Macedonian uh, pikes, they they had because of their length, and the guys who, who held them, they they usually. Uh, grabbed it at the back end, so they needed. They had all the point and the, all the balance shifted um, 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 back uh, um, forward on the length. So they had a, an extra weight at the back end, so that it could um, at least uh, make the the balance uh, point closer to to the hands, possibly on the hands themselves, because. Otherwise, it's pretty complicated and too tiring to to keep. Um, but what is interesting about these lengths is, is that they suggest, in the way uh, you know, they're very they're not very long. So the the idea is that the balance um, um, and the grabbing point therefore had to be quite close to the back end. And this implies one thing, considering that that the the Assyrians didn't have a real phalanx like. 
the more thick formations. I don't know, maybe they also had. I am not really an expert, but my suggestion, especially in this um, later stage, for certain types of units, but more of this later, I, I don't want to say too much because otherwise uh, it's a bit too uh, pushed in the other sense. But the idea is that, um, and, and look at also the small shield, is that um, this small uh, spear with um, this very um, backwards balancement was used for a very dynamic fencing. Very rapid, um, uh, I don't know how to you you say that, but when it's when you push the the spear onwards and you're gonna uh, make and I um, I'm gonna find you the uh, um, the term um, the um, the the lunge yeah in fencing yes where you do very fast lunges and uh, lunges and what you can see from here is is that the guy uh, could definitely use, by the way, this this very type one represented here even as a javelin. Why not? You have to think that spears normally could be used as javelins, even in in every age practically. So it's not that these were mm, weapons perfectly designed to be either a javelin or a spear. But the the way that back end that tells that it was something meant to remain as long as possible into the hands of the fighter uh, and especially paired with such a small shield it and, and w which is shot such a short length of the spear relatively short one it suggests that it was make uh, it, it was meant to make uh, a series of uh, very fast and very um, dangerous lunges uh, in coordination with the shield so a yeah, very uh, a very aggressive um, fencing uh, style that uh, actually goes pretty well along with what we know about the, the role of, of a Syrian infantry on the battlefields that was meant really to, to crush, to assault aggressively and to, to crush the enemy uh, r resistance. Um, and um, so uh, something that goes well along, to technically speaking, with not the idea of a very solid phalanx in the sense that you can have definitely, um, these were presumably um, packed formations w with a certain discipline, a certain order, and they had to remain compact, but it wasn't, the concept wasn't the one of a, of a phalanx, I mean of guys that had to be stuck together and really um, concentrating on the I impenetrability of the ranks. These guys were much more individually, uh, individual minded in their fight, um, which is normal given that the, the idea of discipline could be applied to, to certain elite mm, bodies but the, the rest of the infantry was very kind of average in this sense and yet attached to a kind of, um, of warrior past even though we're talking about very already very sedentary civilizations but this doesn't mean however that living especially in the country or somewhere um, in certain hilly and mountainous regions that m more primitive um, lifestyles were retained with a much greater emphasis on the individual individual skill. But um, what w I want to say um, about uh, relatively to this guy is that um, um, we have to look um, a little bit about the numbers of the proportion into which these um, spearmen existed. Um, and the um, and there is a confrontation that can be done with the um, uh, let's say the the evidence the, the relatively scant evidence that we have relatively to the evolution of the near Syrian army and the role of spearmen, especially relatively to the one of archers from the time of the um, Assyrian king Ashur Na Sir Pal II who lived, uh, if I'm not wrong, at the very beginning of the um, of the Neo-Syrian Empire. Um, yeah, he... Um, not r at the very, very beginning, but uh, basically uh, um, in the mid of the of the 9th century BC, uh, with ones of um, 150 years later at the time of Sargon. 
Now the interesting thing about this is that the armies of Ashur Nasirpal uh, seemingly had um, a higher contingent of spearmen mm, and heavy infantry in general. Um, uh, a consistent body of the army was made up of heavy spearmen, light spearmen and even light swordsmen. Mm, the rest being um, uh, mostly archers with shield bearer uh, too, uh, pioneers and and um, and then cavalry with uh, especially light archers seemingly at the beginning. What do you find at the time of Sargon II is that the proportion of spearmen has radically dropped, and that there is uh, an increase in archers, and especially a greater segmentation of the archer types. There were up to three, um, basically divided. Mm, in the sense that, uh, according to the um, the weight of their armor, so that you find the the top archers were kind of uh, very elite units that that had at this time even a, a much considerable uh, a, a much better protection than the average uh, swordman, excuse me, the average infantryman. Um, and and what you see in fact in here is this poor guy. <laughs> Um, that should represent the average spearman at the time of Sargon II um, that is pretty lightly armored. And even the... the uh, you don't find basically heavy spearmen uh, anymore at this point. At least we have... Uh, uh, they surely existed, but seemingly they had dropped uh, in, in, in numbers. These are a bit speculative suggestions, but effectively from the data this is the trend when that we can trace theoretically. Um, there is also a decrease um, um, uh, in, uh, in swordsmen um, and uh, uh, an increase definitely in, in archers as we were saying. So, and, and from what we see, especially in this, um, thanks to um, um, to these, um, especially to, to, to this archaeological site, of course, but uh, is actually the um, the um, pro progressive lightening of the spearmen. Now, you might quest an increase of, of archers in, in, in synthesis. The question is, what the hell happened and why? And what, what evidence do we have even to suggest other things? Well, first of all, uh, now I, I completely came up um, with this on my own. I, I went checking the, uh, the, the map of the Neo-Syrian Empire at the time of the... Um, maybe I'll post it in the video if you... <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, okay, let's say I I post it now, 27, um, of the Assyrian, uh, the Neo-Syrian Empire at the time of the, uh, of Ashur Narsipal II and at the time of Sargon II. Now, what you see is that the, uh, the Assyrian Empire has considerably enlarged from this Mesopotamic um, area encompassing also parts of Syria to much greater land, the Elam in the east, than even against the Hittites in in uh, the um, and uh, and other uh, people and other Indo-European peoples here in in, in Anatolia, um, in uh, Samaria, uh, the. The Jews were deported practically at this time, and on Egypt as well, and Cyprus you see here, but well, um, and what happened indeed, it seems to me, that um, at this time the, the Neo-Syrian army underwent a um, kind of logical um, differentiation. And I give you also a little bit of, no, well, maybe I give you those, those hints later. Basically, you have this um, fert um, fertile crescent uh, area, so plan plants uh, with uh, rivers and uh, um, great civilizations, urban centers, so a lot of people living there with a stratified um, society already in, in the cities, so uh, guys uh, that um, from the infantry can 
kind of um, provide different levels of equipment, the heavier ones and all, to a greater area that, by the way, encompasses also here the, the Taurus Mountains in the northwest in Anatolia and, and also these other hilly regions, uh, hilly and, and mountainous regions in, in there as well, where Sargon II, uh, as well as his, um, uh, as his father, I believe, too, fought. Um, and in general, to a much larger um, um, mm, uh, distance, a uh, much larger range than it was the usual one. You have to think that the Assyrians made this kind of seasonal um, campaigns every year, so their, mm, their, their strategy, their policy was based on the idea of of mating all these punitive um, ra raids over the um, unruly populations that di didn't want to be subjugated to them. The accounts of the Assyrian uh, campaigns are basically split in three. There is one um, premise and justification for the war that was seen already at that time something very important also in religious perspective and all. Then a uh, f um, followed by a middle part uh, relatively to the um, to the uh, to the actual mm, campaign mm, taking place car being carried out. So all the population subjugated, all the the kings uh, that made act of obedience to the Assyrian um, uh, monarchy uh, monarchs. And um, and then the third one, very important, is about l the loot. How much these raiding uh, uh, parties, we can <laughs> say, these raiding campaigns actually obtain? It was still a very poor material. Uh, these were some of the most advanced area of the world in terms of civilization at the time. But th they they still you can still feel enormously this idea of uh, of the loot. This is something that usually comes from... Looting has always been important in warfare uh, up to today in practice, but uh, typically the loot is something that um, nomads especially take care about because it's the greatest part of their income. Uh, these guys are sedentary, but they still praise the loot as a great form of wealth. So that also uh, these campaigns were also vital for not just for tributes, but also for the, the actual amount of things that, that they were able to rob, aside from just the taxes that the peasantry paid and all. Um, so the expansion into areas like um, the east, um, Sargon II um, invaded also part of the, the Medi in, in, in the Iranian plateau, it built uh, fortresses there. Here you see there is an expansion into even towards Caucasus at the border of the of the Shitsins in, in um, beyond in the steppes. The Taurus campaigns are very important against these Indo-European peoples. Uh, here you see the Sumerians and all. Um, and, and and you see a very long range uh, domination also on um, on today's Palestine and um, and uh, in Egypt and uh, and today's Kuwait and the Persian Gulf and all. So what did happen? You know why did Sargonian infantry seems to be much more shifting towards um, archery and and light spearmen. Uh, uh, another thing that is very important from uh, the um, the time of uh, Ashurnar Sirpal to one of Sargon II, there is also steady increase in cavalry. Mm. Cavalry appears uh, at the time of Sargon II not to be just horse archers but also spearmen um, in 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 consistent numbers, and an increase in the same numbers of cavalry and a reduction in the use of chariots. Chariots were really elite, um, seemingly, you know, it would, was something like approximately, obviously, one chariot every 1,000 infantry and one um, one cavalryman every um, 100 infantry, but that could be also 1 to 10. There, is, there are definitely um, one cavalryman for, for uh, every 10 infantrymen. 
and even maybe one chariot for 100 but uh, I mean the chariots were quite expensive so was cavalry but there is an increase there are also other hints um, remember the mountainous terrains here in the picture of the guy um, it, it's not really uh, it's not really present but <coughs> if I'm not wrong from the same Korsabad um, uh, palace a fortress of Sargon. There is evidence of certain um, nice, quite neat, by the way, <laughs> uh, boots um, made uh, in a in a fashion that was extremely, um, similarly, um, uh, the same one of the. Um, um, with with uh, with certain um, little boats that were typical of those populations that lived into the uh, the Anatolian mountains. Um, the um, part of uh, that naturally armored um, Assyrians uh, existed at uh, in among the spearmen at, uh, at the time of Sargon II as well. But they seemed uh, to be wearing at this point something lighter than the usual uh, armor. We're always talking on average, really, and um, you don't have to think that the lamellar um, um, cur cuirass uh, w disappeared. It's just that something else starts to to appear, mm, and it seems that experiments on average tend to be uh, lighter. And uh, and what you see is that this new form of of um, of cuirass was um, a much more flexible one, basically uh, uh, a tunic um, with some kind of reinforcement, probably square bosses or horn or metal sewn on on the tunic itself, mm -hmm. um, which could be quite effective against against strokes, but it still gave. More flexibility than the the iconic lamellar um, um, uh, armor that usually you find the uh, the Assyrians um, to warriors um, equipped with. Um, so and um, and 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 also smaller shields, which is very important. Um, you know, shields are protective, but they also weight. So. Uh, you have to to find a sort of compromise. So my conclusion, just to you know, to be quite um, <laughs> simplistic in practice, is that as many other times in history, when um, there is a core of a civilization that normally dwells into um, a quite mm, a sedentary civilization that dwells into uh, an urbanized fertile area like the fertile crescent, crescent definitely was and uh, and there is um, f an infight especially between cities and, uh, and relative um, um, citizens we can't say if, even if they weren't citizens properly as uh, politically speaking they were subjects but there was still I don't know craftsmen people who, who were relatively well off for the time standards who could equip themselves um, and, and at a shorter range, uh, it is kind of obvious, um, this is valid for the Greeks uh, before up to the Peloponnese War, this is, this is true for communal armies uh, in, in the Middle Ages, um, in, in many occasions really, um, that the armies are made up of heavy, heavier infantry, less, um, less mobile uh, infantry. Uh, better armored, so this thickly packed formation to basically withstand one of the other in pitched battles. Chariots as well, because if you have a flat ground you can use that and that's pretty effective, uh, even if declining <laughs> at the time. And uh, really also a, a warlike edis that probably emphasized the idea that cavalry is a bit of a coward thing like in the ancient world on average if you s if you were on on horseback the the concept is that you could flee the battlefield on it so you were a potential coward with a chariot it could happen as well even though um, the uh, the idea was a bit more complicated uh, because chariots at this point were meant to kind of 
throw a lot of arrows so to be a bit of skirmishing and then eventually unloading uh, troops on, on battlefield here and there uh, and eventually to simply charge into the soften up the enemy uh, ranks um, but um, this is something that that there was a style of warfare was progressively declining progressively because even you know you, you find chariots in Mesopotamia for up to very very late to the Roman times even I, I've drank just a little <laughs> think about the Seleucids but it was a bit of an anachronism um, and this is a time of the rise of infantry practically so we know that Assyrian um, infantrymen mm, mm, exactly under uh, Sargon II there is a there is a um, and there is a source that states that basically maybe e even the, the famous letter of, of Sargon that describes his his military affairs um, uh, he relatively to the campaign he carried out um, that um, that says that uh, the 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 chariot the, the chariots and the cavalry of one rebel king uh, had been slaughtered by his uh, spearmen. So this is very interesting. Um, so not really, I'm not really saying this. Um, to to conclude the the thought, when the 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 Assyrian Empire expanded at one point, first of all, you you kind of get out of that ritual warfare that you can do among uh, peoples that are kind of similar urbanized and uh, that kind of share certain rules of combat even in some measure and you have to deal with with, with an empire that, that is the stretches from Egypt to 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 the, to, to, per to what would have been eventually Persia and from the Persian Gulf to to the center of Anatolia so something r huge mm, from Caucasus to the the Arab deserts so what you need first of all is more mobile troops so more cavalry not surprisingly uh, most of the terrains think of Caucasus Anatolia and the Iranian plateau are mountainous notoriously um, even Assyria in some places what was definitely but they, they were they had been relatively abandoned because the greater um, reaches and wealth were in, in, in on the plain on the fertile crescent um, so you need troops that have to climb over rocks over hills you can't have very heavy infantrymen mm. uh, the the idea of the boots that appear uh, in in the on the guy's feet at this point is like s th that were the same ones in use into the Anatolian plateau I I is is definitely are extremely meaningful. I mean these guys were taking the same military uh, uh, gear of the guys who were fighting on that ground on that terrain. So the first and most immediate consequence is that you need quite more agile troops not big rectangular shields to use in a in pitched battle like a, w a shield wall and all but smaller shields to find uh, to fight ambushes on the mountains and the forests on stuff like that lighter equipment more flexible equipment uh, the lamellar cuirass was definitely uh, very uh, very heavy it kind of bent it as well f for the movements but it, it, it was definitely uh, much less comfortable than this uh, tunic with um, horn or metal bosses uh, soon uh, on it. Um, the appearance of crests on helmets. What what can it suggest? Maybe it's. I think it's just a coincidence. I can't find a proper uh, attachment to that. Normally crests are put uh, on helms just to to scare the enemy off, to to look taller, to look more intimidating, or simply to be recognized also by friends and enemies. Um, but also an increase in cavalry and the reduction in use of, of chariots um, is also pretty meaningful. Mm. Cavalry can go on terrains into onto which chariots can't. The, uh, the, the flexibility of Sargonian uh, armies over the ones of, of the, the previous centuries in the Assyrian army is, is definitely evident. Mm. I think that, uh, however, is more interesting, and we kind of come back on 
on what we were talking about before is the increase of archers. Now, this is true, archers are kind of mobile troops uh, in this sense, uh, so they, they're they good actually to fight on mountains, especially if they can exploit the advantage of, of gravity and they are on a higher ground, so they can be more effective on the enemy and the projectile has more energy together with the uh, gravitational acceleration. Uh, and um, you can definitely send them, uh, you know, hide them into valleys, make ambushes, stuff like that. Um, what is more interesting to me is the appearance of a, of a segmentation into the archers, into mm, two, even three types, with a quite a elite, el elite one. So we we're saying that seemingly the Assyrians used uh, archers quite, uh, quite intensely. We know that even during sieges, by the way, um, archers were extremely important. They kind of make a made of suppression fire um, over the guys that were over the walls and, and vice versa from the walls all over the um, besiegers. You have to think of these um, Semitic uh, cities in the first millennium BC as the, the most advanced cities of the world at the time. So very strong, heavy, strong walls and all. Uh, stone walls and um, and 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 Assyrian siege warfare was the uh, at the vanguard at, at the time in the world. So the Assyrians definitely knew what we were doing, and my idea is that this increase of um, of archers types and is um, is really the um, really responded the need of having a kind of. Uh, <laughs> A kind of archer infantryman. I mean, if you look uh, even at, at the uh, original guy here with the with the lengths, uh, with the short lengths and all, it's kind of a light guy. You know, if this is what if this was the the spear, the average spearman, uh, uh, you find that it has just the spear that that is uh, definitely an offensive um, um, measure, but uh, a weapon, but. Uh, uh, we see that uh, the um, the the archers in in Sargonian army ap appear together with spearmen, with, uh, with with shield bearers, telling the truth that were probably also equipped with spears, so they kind of were defended in that sense. But it seems to me in this suggestion that the the archer kept being increasingly more involved into risky business in at close range into danger dangerous situation. And that in this sense, on mountainous terrain, archery uh, even increases uh, its uh, its importance uh, in many ways, um, without even obviously also losing them in pitch battles in the same time. So the archer is used as a sort of multitask troop that gets increasingly more involved into hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting, even if not if um, not really by um, you know. In in opti in optimal conditions, because you you don't use archers to fight uh, on hand to hand combat normally, but hey, it can happen. So you need heavier protection, uh, protection that in this sense uh, seems to 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 surpass even the one of the spearmen, where ga the guys who were meant to practically fight um, uh, in melee combat into hand to hand. So the Sargonian spearmen was a more agile uh, one in the previous times in the Neo Assyrian army, uh, more flexible, more capable of uh, fighting on difficult terrain, lighter, with a lighter shield, uh, with a lighter armor, um, probably also increasingly, um, it might have been also as well drawn from, from local uh, troops uh, the the um, mi uh, the mixture of um, you know those boots that I those Anatolian boots that so much uh, kind of um, kind of struck me uh, are quite eloquent in this. There was definitely a um, a cultural exchange of some sort in as in all military um, business, um, and this. Uh, brought was bringing the the Syrian army to be much more diverse, mm, much more um, flexible and capable of uh, moving at a longer range. Even think about the logistical costs of 
especially for those times technology was still rather primitive of taking more armor or weapons I mean um, Assyrians normally did raid so raids are effective as soon as they are quick fast and they they're over soon because otherwise the enemy can react and pass to counterattack and then you can uh, if he's already prepared at the beginning for this you 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 don't have to uh, and uh, you, you you're gonna suffer that because he's in defense you're in attack so you're always in on average on something that makes you lose more energies than, than what he loses and also the the increase of cavalry in this sense I think it's pretty meaningful cavalry's best arm for raiding it's fast uh, it can uh, it can mm, explore even if considering the uh, the, the literal um, physical expansion of this empire into new lands I mean you need scouts you need explorers you need people who carry out uh, uh, these um, actions um, most of the times to preserve the core of the army so yes I think that this might be the right explanation overall and as you understand it's a complex of factors not really something <coughs> mechanical definitely heavy spearmen kept existing um, even at the end of the Neo-Syrian Empire um, it's just that they were less useful abroad when camping in, in other lands in this seems um, pretty normal uh, in many ways and uh, considering all the amount of information we have on the Syrian warfare this might be a good explanation tell me what you think and uh, if you like this video please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further news uh, about my content um, and uh, as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!